Thank you, Cornelius, uh, for the introduction. Thanks, everybody uh, in the audience for joining us to, together with the uh, three distinguished speakers. Uh, before we jump in, so we'll be hearing today about environmental challenges and how science and microbial research in particular could really help. Uh, but I think before we plunge into all the environmental challenges, which are huge, I think we should first uh, appreciate how lucky we are. Uh, we are not only blessed with a fantastic planet, uh, but we also live in a time uh, where most of humanity enjoys food, water, the ability to heat and cool their houses, as well as you know, mobility, communication, like we're doing now in education, like never before. What we enjoy comes with a toll uh, of a global environmental crisis, which is one excellent reason to have the session that we'll be having today. And so uh, I think we should begin the meeting with a sense of how blessed we are, and also with a sense of urgency, because uh, a lot needs to happen in the next 10 years. And it's crucial that science will play a key role in that. And within science, I think the over 100 people who joined us now are the people that I hope will be joining the effort. And perfectly suited to begin this uh, journey is Professor Dan Newman from Caltech. She's one of the world's leaders in how microbes shape our biosphere. Uh, she also shared with me that uh, she was a humanities major in college and never would have dreamed she'd wind up as a molecular geobiologist uh, as she thought biology and geology were boring and all about memorization. By chance, she discovered microbial metabolism and genetics in graduate schools, and finally saw the light. So Diane, please share some of the light with us. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you all for coming to this session. I, I loved your introduction, Ron. I think it set just the right tone. And it's really my honor to begin um, by telling you about the impact and the promise of microbial metabolism. So to get some perspective, let's start with the view of our planet that Neil Armstrong had when he landed on the moon. And something I think important to appreciate about this picture is that Neil Armstrong is in a spacesuit because for his metabolism, he cannot survive without oxygen. And in fact, oxygen is so intuitively part of how we think about life that when we look for signatures of life on exoplanets, we often look for, in the infrared planetary spectra, signatures of ozone, for instance, like you see here in Earth. Um, of course, water is really important for habitability as we know it. And when we see signs of ozone, this implies that there's oxygen in the atmosphere and we think, well, maybe uh, that planet has, has life. And yet what I want you to appreciate is that had we been looking for oxygen on Earth, we would have missed the first billion years of life's history. And so let's just take in the timeline of Earth history and recognize that the Earth is four and a half billion years old. Microbial life is thought to have originated around 3.8 billion years ago, but it wasn't until roughly two and a half billion years ago that we see signatures of oxygen in the atmosphere. Now that means there was at least one billion years of the history of microbial life on the planet where they were subsisting through metabolisms that trafficked in things other than oxygen. And though animals evolved on a microbial world uh, after oxygen came on the scene, as we know from some of the remarkable progress in studying the human microbiome, we've got a ton of microbes within us, um, and there are even many, many more uh, within the microbiome of the Earth. And within both of these habitats, both within the human gut and within many locales on Earth, there remain many anaerobic habitats. So there's all sorts of remarkable ways that microbes have figured out how to conserve energy in the absence of oxygen. Now this is important because uh, through this time, uh, microbes have been very clever. And these different strategies that they've evolved for energy conservation have led and continue to lead to profound impacts for the planet, as I'll give you a few examples of in just a moment. But what I want to also impress upon you is the fact that these diverse microbial metabolisms have incredible potential to be harnessed for a variety of purposes to help the planet going forward. So let's think very broadly about metabolism and energy conservation just to put this into context. So for us, 
our mitochondria are utilizing electrons ultimately derived from organic carbon and oxidizing uh, this uh, electron donor with oxygen. Um, that's the electron acceptor. Uh, converting the substrates into CO2 and water, which chloroplasts found in plants recycle. And so this is the familiar cycle between animal and plant metabolism that many of you are familiar with. Of course, I want to impress upon you that the mitochondrion and chloroplast are nothing more than ancient bacteria that were engulfed once upon a time in an endosymbiotic event. And What's critical to realize is that the substrates used by diverse microbes are numerous, and it's really all about the ability for redox chemistry to be captured in a way that promotes energy conservation. So redox chemistry is the reduction, the gaining of an electron, coupled to the oxidation, the loss of an electron. And so here written generically, I have the electron donor as A reductant and the electron acceptor as B oxidant. Now, a remarkable diversity of substrates can serve as electron donors or acceptors for microbial metabolism, ranging from organic solvents to minerals to gases to even toxic metalloids. And the particular way in which energy is conserved from these various substrates varies depending upon the substrate, but for metabolisms that involve energy conservation at the level of the membrane, they all work something like this, where the reductant, the electron donor, interacts with an enzyme in the membrane, passing electrons through this enzyme coupled to ion translocation. And typically this is either a proton or a sodium ion outside of the membrane. And then the electron is passed through carriers down the chain, ultimately to the terminal electron acceptor or B oxidant, which gets reduced. And in this process, what winds up happening is a wonderful potential is generated around the membrane like a battery that can be harnessed to drive uh, the work of making ATP through ATP synthases embedded in the membrane. And this leads to energy conservation. Now, the effort to understand how in molecular detail this works is absolutely fascinating, and it provides rich opportunities for impactful discoveries and application, as you're going to hear later in this seminar. So let me give you just a few examples of big picture effects from different electron donors and acceptors. So as I said at the beginning, um, our oxygen in the atmosphere is a biosignature. In specifically, it is the remnants of uh, the invention of oxygenic photosynthesis, where water was used as an electron donor uh, to support photosynthetic growth. Yet prior to this particular form of photosynthesis, there were others including some that utilized ferrous iron as an electron donor in what is called anoxygenic photosynthesis. And there's good reason to believe that going way back in time, over three billion years ago, some of the ore deposits on Earth, such as this here, uh, a banded iron formation from Western Australia, may indeed have been deposited due to this alternative form of photosynthesis. Now today, we know that on short time scales, microbes can actually remediate um, waste dumps, uh, such as in the case of the Deepwater Horizon oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico, where petroleum um, toxic compounds like benzene and toluene have been degraded uh, because they're used as an electron donor, uh, supporting the growth of a diversity of microbes in this environment. And yet microbial Metabolism doesn't always lead to good things. Um, what's also true is that in certain environments, such as in groundwaters of Bangladesh, uh, the input of organic carbon exceeds the amount of oxygen present in these systems, so that alternative electron acceptors like iron minerals or even the toxic metalloid arsenate begin to be used to oxidize those organic substrates. And this can tragically lead to the mobilization of toxins. Now, understanding how these things happen can allow us to invent diagnostics to know when certain activities are occurring and even think forward to how we might control them. And what I want to pose to you as a challenge to the young people in the audience is what I consider an important and unresolved question in microbial ecology about the future involving global warming potential and microbial feedbacks. But first, let's step into the past uh, to appreciate this metabolism and go to Lake Cuomo in uh, northern Italy in 1776, the same year as the Declaration of Independence in the United States. 
Here we have a picture of Alessandro Volta poking at the sediments in this lake. And what he's doing is collecting in a glass jar bubbles from these sediments. Through ingenious experiments that he did, he was able to figure out that the bubbles contained the gas methane. And this was the discovery of methanogenesis, an incredibly important metabolism catalyzed by microbial archaea. Here you see an example of a Volta flame experiment being performed today. So I hope you heard the dramatic sound effects coupled to that. Uh, this is an incredibly fun thing to do. Um, be careful, don't singe your hair if you do it. Uh, but what it shows you is that there's an incredible amount of methane that you can even find in, in simple bogs or lakes um, in freshwater environments all over the planet. While it's dramatic and while it's fun, it also connects to something actually rather rather serious which is that we now know um, that the 20-year global warming potential of methane exceeds by 80 times that of CO2. And why do we care about this? Well, the reason we care is that if we look in the northern hemisphere at the frozen permafrost, whether it's in the marine or in the terrestrial realm, what we have is an unknown, which is that this permafrost is thawing, and within these permafrosts are a lot of um, tons of carbon. So this has been quantified nicely in this uh, study by Crother et al, where what you're looking at is the global carbon stocks as a function of latitude. And I want to focus you on this rightmost portion, which is where you see by far the most carbon stocks being present underground here in these northern permafrost latitudes. So what will happen as they warm? We can even see evidence of warming today. Here's a photo of slumping permafrost in northern Canada. Will CO2 be released? Will methane? Or will microbial communities adapt so that there's a steady state that's maintained? We don't really know, but we need to know. We want to understand how fast changes might occur here. And importantly, we need to be able to understand what might limit them. These are very critical questions for the future that I hope some of you might begin to get interested in following this presentation. Now, for any question such as this, to be able to predict how microbes will affect the planet and to control and harness their metabolism, we need to do the following. First and foremost, we must understand in mechanistic detail how they catalyze reactions of interest. What are the enzymes? What are the cofactors? What are the rates of these enzymes? What limits them? How widely distributed are they? These are questions that our following speakers, uh, Rob and Toby, are going to address in their talks. In addition, we need to understand the regulation of these processes, and we need to think very carefully about the potential for quantitative impact, something our host, Ron Milo, has really led us and inspired us to do as a field. So for the remaining time, I want to give you just a quick taste of research from my lab where we were captivated by questions involving soil bacteria, and particularly those that produce colorful pigments and ones which change color over time. Here you see a lovely plate of the Munch scream rendered in soil bacteria making pigments. This was done by Tomislav Ivankovic, a scientist at the University of Zagreb. And the type of pigments that interest me in my lab are ones such as this that you see here in the middle, which changes its color over the distribution and length of this colony. An organism that we study in my lab is Pseudomonas originosa, and we play games with it where we can introduce oxygen by aerating it, and it turns color. And then as it sits, the color changes and it goes back to where it started. Now what's happening here is that this organism is producing a redox active pigment called a phenazine, which when it is produced in its reduced state, it is clear. But when oxygen is introduced into the system, it oxidizes the molecule, turning it blue, and oxygen in turn receives those electrons and becomes superoxide. And it's the generation of superoxide that has made people previously think phenazines are antibiotics and toxic. Yet we questioned whether this was the full story. And the reason we questioned this is that it had been known for a long time that the production of phenazines were regulated by quorum sensing, that they turned on as cells were reaching the tail end of growth, using up oxygen, that's when they would make these compounds. And then they would start recycling them. So why does this matter? Well, in the absence of oxygen, having a self-made electron acceptor would be incredibly convenient, but only if one could recycle it. 
And so that's a challenge mechanistically. How is it at a distance through a process called extracellular electron transfer, do these beautiful pigments uh, serve as electron acceptors to the cell and become regenerated? Something I'm happy to talk about later. Be the mechanism as it may, what this leads to is the conservation of energy, which enables the sustenance of slow growth in communities that are oxygen limited, such as microbial biofilms, which form on a wide diversity of substrates. Here you see a scanning electron micrograph showing you all of these hundreds of cells in a biofilm. And the important number to recall is that after the first 10 microns, the pace of aerobic respiration outcompetes the diffusion of oxygen into these films. So the guys in the middle are literally struggling for survival. They need an oxidant. And it's under these conditions that they cleverly are able to make and recycle their own. And understanding this, I think, is very interesting, both fundamentally, because slow growth really is the dominant pace of life in the microbial world, yet very poorly understood. And it's also practically important, because slow growth often underpins antibiotic tolerance. And so having a mechanistic understanding of what sustains these populations can open up new approaches to controlling biofilms in both nature and disease. Now, thinking about other contexts where phenazine recycling is important, we can replace oxygen with an iron mineral, such as found in the soil. And oftentimes, phosphate is attached to iron minerals, such that when phenazines transfer electrons to these iron oxides, they liberate phosphate due to mineral transformations that make it no longer able to be bound as well. And this potentially is something useful that we can consider harnessing. And so it raises the question, can we engineer organisms to generate these phenazines under environmentally relevant conditions? And might this provide an opportunity for bioaugmentation that would enable greater access to phosphorus, a limiting nutrient in many agricultural contexts? Might it make it easier for us to fertilize fields in a way that is more sustainable and less wasteful? Well, we're just beginning to get into these questions. Uh, through um, bioinformatic approaches, we've been able to quantify in global metagenomes the proportion of bacteria in rhizospheres. That's the zone of the soil in the vicinity of plant roots. And what we find is that phenazine production is widespread, that roughly 1% of bacteria in rhizospheres encode the machinery to make these molecules. So this gives us hope that this might be something to leverage in this type of context to further um, the ability to utilize phosphorus more sustainably. Now a final example I'll give is if we replace that iron mineral with an electrode. Same thing can happen. Phenazines can be reoxidized if the electrode's potential is poised appropriately. Only in this case, the product of the oxidation of the phenazine is the generation of current. And this then opens up all sorts of application for utilization of small molecules like phenazines to stimulate microbial fuel cells. Whether these be fuel cells involved in remote power on the ocean floor or fuel cells coupled to wastewater treatment plants, certain um, exciting forays into this area are now beginning in Europe and other parts um, of the globe. There's a lot to do, but it's a potential to actually invest in more creative energy capture in a wide variety of locales. So with this, I'll just wrap up and, and leave you with a thought, especially the trainees. And that is that sometimes curiosity about something basic, like how it is that bacteria change color, can have surprisingly broad relevance and open up many more questions and challenges. So I hope in your, your own scientific careers, you'll have the opportunity to pursue your curiosity. We absolutely need new talent to come into this important realm of planetary biology to bring the power of mechanistic molecular analysis to environmental problems. We need institutional support, so we're grateful to the EMBL, HHMI, other institutions you know, for promoting uh, these efforts. And very importantly, we need quantitative grounding and global organization because these type of problems transcend what any individual institution can achieve. So I'm highlighting for you two outstanding websites that I'll be happy to talk about more in the Q&A that I encourage you to take a look at. The first one, Human Impacts, uh, put together by Ron Milo um, and my colleague Rob Phillips at Caltech, has some great numbers explaining to us how human activities are impacting the biosphere in a quantitative way. 
I hope increasingly we'll see information on this site about how microbial interventions have the potential to impact certain sustainability problems. And lastly, I want to do a shout out to the fungi. This is a great uh, website by Toby Kears in the Netherlands informing us about their critical roles. Thank you.